Good morning, Bowtie Nation. Joseph Hogue here. Thank you for joining us for another one of these Monday market updates. Coming to you Tuesday, of course, this week because of the market closure yesterday. Great video for you today. And really the biggest question for investors, is the stock market crash over, right? Stocks in the S&P 500, that broad stock market index, are up 14% from those October lows. And a lot of investors are wondering, is this the new bull market? They don't want to be late. They don't want to be sitting out waiting for stocks to fall lower before they put their money to work. And there is a case to be made for higher stock prices from here. The Fed is widely expected to raise rates one more time when they meet in February and then to pause and then to stop raising rates, eventually cutting rates even to support the economy, which should boost stock prices. But what do we have in between? We have earnings. We have a lot of other bear market factors that could bring stock back down. So that's what we want to talk about today. Is the stock market crash over? How do you invest in this kind of an environment? Stick around though, because then we'll have our Monday market updates, all the stocks I'm watching, the sectors, the news that could highlight the week. Before we get started, I do want to tell you about a special offer from Seeking Alpha. A lot of you know, I started writing on Seeking Alpha in 2009, really one of my first paid analysis jobs before working with venture capital, private wealth management, and really as a stock market analyst. Uh, I've always since used their premium access though, some of the best stock research you'll find on the internet. A couple of months ago, a friend still at Seeking Alpha reached out, said he wanted to offer all you out there in the community a special promotion, a special deal, 50% off, save $120 off their premium access membership. You're going to get access to all the best articles and analysis. You're going to be able to listen in on company earnings reports and conference calls. Uh, a lot of great stock screeners there to use. So I'm going to leave a link in the description below. Click through that, try it out. You're going to get 50% off, save more than $120. So the best deal you're going to find online. Uh, and uh, again, like I said, I use it too. But I want to get to today's topic because I know it is the number one question all investors are asking right now. Is the stock market crash over? I know a lot of you out there, stocks up 14%. You're worried that if you get in too late, you're going to miss out on a lot of those, those returns. That next bull market, a lot of you out there worried that if you jump in too early, you're going to lose money if the stock market does continue its, its momentum lower. So I want to cover the bear and the bull case, the case for both sides. I want to show you how to invest to protect your portfolio if stocks sell off again, but still make money if prices continue higher. The biggest downside case that the bears have right now is really that we haven't seen that full effect of higher interest rates on the economy yet, or, or the drop in profits that comes with that and a recession. Here we're looking at a chart by Visual Capitalist. It shows the last six instances where the Fed was increasing interest rates, right? So when, in, when inflation gets too hot, then the Fed increases interest rates to slow down the economy, slow down inflation, and and that's supposed to uh, that's supposed to bring everything back to normal and you see these six instances here 2015 to 2018 on the far right you see 99 to 2000 94 to 95 uh, 88 to 89 2004 to 2006 when they were trying to slow down that housing market bubble and then all the way to the left here you see 2022 uh, and the height of these is how far they raised interest rates right? That is, uh, that is the percentage points that they raised interest rates. Here it says 2.36%. They've actually increased that quite a bit more up to about four, four and a half percent. And then the down at the bottom is the months since the rate hike cycle started. Okay. So most of these, you can see that they rose, they increased rates at a very much slower pace. For example, here on the right, the 2015 to 2018 pace, they raised rates at 2% but it took them 36 months to do it. They raised rates very gradually over three years. Even in some of these others, in the 2004 to 2006, when they were trying to slow down that housing market bubble, they raised rates by 4%, so very, very high, just like they've done over the last year. But here it took them almost two, it took them two years. It took them about 24 months to raise rates those 4%. Here, what we're talking about here though, is if you look at this 2022, that arrow should actually be clear up here to the 4% because they ra increased rates over the last year by about 4%. That is the fastest pace they have done that in 40 years. And the problem here is it just takes time for the economy to really feel the effects of those higher rates, right? Higher interest rates, higher cost of borrowing. That means companies uh, have to slow down their borrowing. They can't do those projects. That means people aren't going to be spending on those big ticket purchases like the cars, the housing. We've already seen this housing market slow down considerably this year. And usually the economy really doesn't even start to slow down for about six months after those first rates. Hikes. So we are just now starting to see the effects on the economy of the first rate hikes that they started last year. We haven't seen a lot of those rate hike effects come through. So what the bearers are saying is that that higher cost of borrowing and the fast pace of interest rate hikes 
are going to be hitting the economy this year. That's going to hit corporate profits. We're going to look at pretty soon here. That's going to slow down uh, earnings. And of course, stocks are an ownership of corporate earnings, right? Stocks are an ownership of those future earnings of a company. If interest rates jump, Companies are making less money, less earnings, and that means stock prices have to come down to reflect that. And here we have the estimates for what those companies are gonna say about those earnings. That first highlighted the Q4 2022, analysts are projecting an earnings decline of 3.9% on revenue growth of 3.9%, right? So what does this mean? Analysts are expecting, and analysts are usually pretty darn close to what companies are actually report in the uh, in the quarter ahead analysts are expecting companies companies in the s&p 500 uh to say that they lost they made four percent less in profits than the same quarter the same three months in the year before so again think about what that means if companies are saying they make they're making less money less profits and stocks are an ownership of those profits then stock prices need to come down to adjust to that but that's not even the worst of it because that 3.9 percent expected decline in earnings that is skewed by one very big sector the energy sector the energy stocks in the s p 500 are actually expected to report 60 percent earnings growth okay all those all those oil companies the natural gas companies energy stocks in the s p 500 are expected to report their profits 60 percent higher in the last three months of last year compared to the, the last three months of the year before now that is skewing this 3.9 percent average that's skewing that higher if you take out energy stocks then this actually becomes a drop of 8% in earnings for the rest of the companies in the S&P 500. Analysts report expect that companies in the S&P 500 X energy, so minus the energy stocks, are going to report that they made 8% less in earnings over the last three months than they did the year before. So if you think about what's going on here, stock prices are at 14% since those October lows, but earnings are down. Earnings are going to be down about 8% on a year-over-year -year basis. If you look at the two sides of valuation on the, on the stock market, how we value the stocks, how we say, okay, are these stocks cheap or are they expensive? That price-to-earnings ratio, okay, how much how much price are investors going to be paying for those earnings, for those earnings that, that you know, are the ownership uh, in stocks, are, are the ownership of the company? And so if prices go up, earnings come down, that price to earnings ratio is getting higher and higher. And that means stocks are getting expensive. Now, if we look out for the next six months, for this first quarter and second quarter, I've got these two lines highlighted here. Analysts are projecting earnings declines again in those first two quarters of negative 0.6% in the first quarter and negative 0.7% in the second quarter. So here again, analysts are saying that it's not just gonna be the last three months of last year, it is gonna be the first six months of this year that we are gonna to continue to see companies saying they are gonna make be making less money. Their, their profits are declining from the year before. And of course, this all ties back to those interest rate hikes, okay? Companies are finally feeling the effects of those interest rates hikes. You know, business is slowing down, the cost of borrowing is going going up and uh, and they're reporting those lower profits. Here we have a chart showing those earnings for the S&P 500, that broad stock market index. And the dark blue is the actual earnings that were reported each year for those companies, for the 500 largest companies in the United States. Here in, in lighter blue, we have the estimates and we still have 2022 estimated because we're still waiting for those full Q4, those fourth quarter earnings. But it is widely expected they're gonna post right around that, that uh, expectations and it's gonna be right around $220 for the full year for all companies in that stock market index, okay? $220 for companies in the S&P 500. Now, if we just take that simple PE formula, right? So uh, stocks in the S&P 500 trading for about 4,000 on the index right now, divided by 220, that means in, on that trailing basis. So for the, for the amount of earnings that those stocks reported in 2022, and the price of 4,000 stocks are now trading for about 18.18 times those earnings. So 18 times on a price to earnings basis for the market. I'm gonna show you a chart that says that that's a, getting a little expensive right now, but if we look at the next year, if we look at 2023, earnings are expected to rise about 4%, 4.3%. That was would be anemic compared to some of these other years of, of six and seven and 8% earnings growth, but 4.3% earnings growth expected for 2023 takes us to 230 
$130 on a price to earn or on a uh, on earnings for the S&P 500. And that may be too optimistic. We've already seen how corporate earnings are expected to fall. They may fall even faster if the economy really starts to reflect those past interest rate hikes. Uh, I think it's probably more likely that stocks get closer to 225, maybe even 220 in corporate earnings this year. So basically flat earnings growth this year. So if we take all this together, stocks just are not cheap enough to make up for that risk and the uncertainty, right? The uncertainty that if we do get a recession, how bad is it going to be? How much further are corporate earnings really going to fall uh, at $220 per share in earnings? Again, companies in the S&P 500 are trading at 18.2 times on a price to earnings basis. You see that right here in this dark blue line. And of course, those were much higher. It was 35 times in the height of that of that 2021 bear bull market, but you can also see it has also been very much lower. It's been down as low as 14, 16, 14, 15 times on a price to earnings basis. Uh, there in the pandemic, there in 2018 when the stock market fell, and then back in 2013 when we were still recovering from the housing market bubble. You can see here in the blue dash line that 10-year average for the PE ratio. The 10-year average is right above 20, about 20.2. So stocks are cheaper than that 10-year average, that long, long-term average, but they are just not cheap enough, in my opinion, to really make up for this risk and the uncertainty, the risk that stocks fall further, stocks fall maybe to, down to this 16 or 16 and a half times on a PE ratio. I'm going to show you how to invest in this, but there is a case to be made for higher stock prices from here that, that we are in the start of a new bull market and that you don't want to miss out on. You know, the bulls point to lower natural gas prices. Natural gas prices around the world have plunged about 40% just over the past couple of months. And in fact, that means the EU, the European Union, may avoid a, a recession that was all but certain just a couple of months ago. Uh, China has has eased up in December. It's three years of near lockdown restrictions for COVID. So that, that means that the, the world's second largest economy may be growing again in 2023, even if the rest of the world has a recession. Here in the US, the bulls point out that inflation is coming down. Here we see the Consumer Price Index, that CPI report, peaked out at 9% in June, a multi-decade high, but has come down quite a bit. It's now down about 6.4% 6 6 there in December, so it does look like inflation is coming down. Those interest rate hikes are slowing down the economy, slowing down inflation, and that just means the, the probability the Fed will stop raising interest rates when they meet in February and eventually can, in fact, lower rates to help the economy if we do fall into a recession. In that case, if we do avoid a recession and corporate profits keep rising in 2023, whereas we were looking at analysts expecting $230 in earnings this year, we could go as high as $235 on the S&P 500. That would mean on that price to earnings basis, 4,000 divided by 235, that would mean stocks are only trading for about 17 times those profits, 17 times on that price to earnings basis. That's still not exactly cheap, but it is a 19% discount to the long-term, that 10-year average that we looked at. And believe it or not, folks, this is normal for the stock market, okay? There are always going to be bulls and bears trying to to make their argument for higher or lower stock prices. Uh, what is so difficult in this later stage of a bear market is that the case for both sides is so strong. You know, when the economy is roaring higher, then, then the bears still have some kind of a case, still are always trying to plead that uh, maybe stocks are expensive or the economy is going to slow down, but it's not quite as strong. Here in the later, later stages of a bear market, we do have both sides of very strong sides, a very strong cases for why stocks could go higher or lower. And that's why there's been so much volatility. That's why stocks have jumped around so much lately, up 2% one day just to crash and give it back the next couple of days. Now that's going to give you a few options for how to invest your money. Uh, one, you can just invest as you normally do. Okay, Deposit money each month from your paycheck, buy your favorite stocks each month, take that long-term view, and, and don't worry about what stocks do. Folks, for 99% of the people out there, this is the best strategy you can take. Just just invest each month. Don't worry about where the stock market is going. Invest in that long-term view and you're going to do great. It's a great stress-free buy and hold way to invest. But if you are worried that stocks might be giving back some of that 15% gain from, from October, that earnings are going to fall and we're likely to see stocks give back some of that in, here in the first few months of 2023, then hold maybe 10 or 15% of your portfolio in cash, right? Still make take money out of your paycheck regularly every couple of weeks. Put it in your depo deposit into your uh, portfolio account 
but just don't buy anything with it, right? Let it sit there in cash, let it build up, and uh, for to give you the opportunity to buy stocks if they do come down. You know, this is the strategy I'm using. It's one that we've used last year and really helped us take advantage of those lower stock prices and the bear market rallies when, when stocks would jump up and then fall back down again. For when to use this cash, when to invest this cash and put it to work, I'm actually waiting for 38.50 on the S&P 500. That would be about 4% down from here. So if stocks just fall a little bit, give up a little bit of those gains, back down to 38.50 on the S&P 500, that's when I'll probably put about a third of my cash back to work in stocks, in the stocks I love. Just, just start buying up some of those long-term stocks that I want. And from there, I'm going to wait till 3,700 to invest the third. Uh, and finally, if the S&P S&P 500 reaches maybe 3,600, I'll invest the rest of the cash. That would be about 10% down from here. And it represents stocks at about 16.3 times on that PE ratio, right? So if stocks fall all the way to 3,600, that's going to be about 16 times the uh, the price to earnings ratio on the S&P 500. That's not to say that uh, stocks are necessarily cheap there or couldn't fall further. It's just the point where I would be comfortable putting my cash to work for that long-term perspective. Now, obviously that is higher than we were waiting last year. We were looking at stocks last year to fall maybe even below 3,500. They reached in October, but I don't think that's the case right now. I don't think I don't think stocks fall below that 3,500 that they hit in October. The economy is still just too strong. The jobs market is still too strong. Consumers are spending, they have lots of money. And I don't think, I do think we have a recession. I do think corporate earnings fall a little bit this year but I don't think they fall as badly as, as what might've been expected last year. And I don't think the stock market falls back down to below 3,500 where it reached in October. Now, of course, if stocks do continue higher and don't reach that 3,850 or the 3,700 by May, then you really have to conclude that we might not see those lower prices, that the economy is just too strong, corporate earnings are gonna be rising, and we are in fact in a new bull market. At that point, I would invest about half of my cash, put it to work in those stocks, uh, but still hold back maybe about another half of that, maybe 5% of my portfolio is still in stocks, maybe some money in bonds, just to give me that ammunition, just to give me the opportunities when stocks eventually do fall once again. And I want to highlight a few of the stocks I'm watching this week. We are starting to see, again, those fourth quarter earnings. So are going to be a lot of earnings coming up over the next few weeks. And it's going to be very important to see what companies say, not just about the last three months of last year, but about the first three months of this year and the rest of 2023. What are these companies saying about their earnings, their profits, and even their sales for this year? Uh, first up here, we've got Prologis ticker PLD. It's one of the largest, uh, one of the largest industrial warehouse. REITs, so Real Estate Investment Trusts in the United States, it's going to report its earnings on Wednesday with expectations for earnings to plunge 66% from last year to just 56 cents a share, even as revenue increased 35% over that period. So they, they are seeing an extreme drop in earnings. Full year 2023 are expected down another 21% on a double digit revenue growth as those higher interest rates and just the operating costs really eat into the company's profits. Okay, so obviously real estate is very highly leveraged, uses a lot of debt. So anytime those interest rates rise, the cost of that debt rises, you're going to see uh, you're going to see REITs, real estate investment trusts just plunge because that interest debt is going to eat into their earnings. And that's really what we're seeing with Prologis with a lot of these others. Now, this is again, this is the global leader of industrial warehouse space going to benefit from that long term shift in e-commerce. This is something we've been following for the last for the last couple of years, in fact. But it's really it's that overbuilding that went on during the pandemic. It's likely going to burden the property type for for probably a few years, right? During the pandemic, we saw all those e-commerce sales. They needed to be stored somewhere before they could be shipped out. So there was just a huge amount of building and, and industrial warehouse space to store these. Now that is overbuilding as people are, are starting to, as people are getting out and going back to those retail spaces. So there is a, there is a saturation of industrial warehouse space for these. Uh, I still like this on that long-term idea because e-commerce is still just 15% of retail sales in the United States. It is growing. It's going to be about 26% over the next few years. And that's going to mean we are still going to need more industrial retail space. It's just going to need time to grow up to that point. Uh, these shares only pay about 2.6% dividend yield, Prologis, versus a 4.1% for competitors Stag Industrial. That's one of my favorite dividend REITs. So I'd go with Stag Industrial here, but I am watching for Prologis just to see what they say about the industrial property market here in 2023. I'm also watching Procter & Gamble, ticker PG, going to give us an important look into the consumer on Thursday and really the sector that saved investors last year. 
Okay, stocks in the consumer staple sector. So pack, food packaging, uh, you know, household products, those products that we really need to buy, whether there's an, a recession or not. Stocks in that consumer staple sector were down just 3% last year against a 20% crash in the S&P 500. So really protected your money. This year could be a different story, though, on those valuations, right? For example, P&G here, Procter & Gamble, trades for 4.8 times on a price-to-sales ratio. Okay, so the price of the stock here, four times, almost five times the sales per share of the stock. That's about a 12% premium to the five-year average. So compared to the five-year price-to-sales ratio, this is trading 12% more expensive than that average. A revenue is expected down up 0.1% for 2023 on earnings that are only expected to be 0.7% up. So really flat earnings, flat sales for uh, for the consumer staples sector and for Procter & Gamble this year. So unless the rest of the market just kind of falls apart again this year, I think P&G and really the rest of the consumer staples sector are going to be kind of dead money. You know, you're going to get a lot of investors leaving stocks in this sector for those higher growth stocks. If the market continues to go higher, it's only going to be if we see another stock market crash that people are going to seek for safety in these in these consumer staple stocks. As for the stock sectors last week, we're here on a sectorspider.com. Great resource. The sector tracker gives you a big picture idea of, of how the sectors and how stocks did last week and, and really any of these periods so we're going to zoom out here to five to five days so last week we did see nine of the 11 stock sectors closed higher with those safety sectors like consumer staples healthcare utilities really lagging as investors sold out of their positions to to get in those riskier stocks as the stock market right rose uh, streaming and social media stocks in the communication services sector really jumped higher we can actually go to communication services here we can click on this to see how stocks in that in that sector did. We see Warner Brothers Discovery up 16% just in last week alone. We see Walt Disney up almost 6%. Uh, Match Group almost up 9%. Uh, all of these streaming stocks, Netflix, the uh, meta platforms, the social media stocks, uh, meta platforms up 5.3%. So a lot of those a lot of those communication services sector stocks jumped and, and could have further to go. This was the hardest hit sector last last year, down about 38% and still trades relatively cheaply, cheaply at just 15.1 times on a price to earnings basis, right? So the stocks in this sector, this communication services sector trading for just 15 times on a price to earnings basis versus a longer term average right around 16 times. So it's a pretty good discount. Uh, and it's one of the few remaining value sectors left after that 14% market rally since October. As far as economic news this week, there are a few data releases that you really need to watch for, especially the, the retail sales for December published on Wednesday. That's expectations to drop 1% after a previous drop of 0.6% in November. It was a very disappointing holiday shopping season. And we've already heard from, from some companies like Bed Bath & Beyond, some other companies that the holiday shopping season did not meet their expectations, that uh, the labor market is still extremely tight for retailers and, and wages are growing faster. You've heard about a lot of layoffs in the tech sector and, and with some of these other uh, the tech and communication services sector stocks, but at that that's that high end of the uh, of the labor market. The lower end, the retail stores, the restaurants, uh, consumer, consumer discretionary stores, the labor market is still very tight there. Wages are going up faster than, than companies in other sectors, and that's going to be eating away at those earnings. So what we saw very what we're going to see here on in in when on Wednesday and as these retailers as these consumer discretionary stocks report their earnings over the next couple of months I, I think you're going to see that sales are much lower than expected sales are very low on that week holiday shopping season the earnings are even lower because not only did they have very weak sales but they had uh, you know they had higher costs higher wages higher uh, inflationary costs in their other stuff so earnings are going to miss expectations for a lot of these consumer discretionary stocks a lot of these retailer companies we could also get a little bit of good news here on Wednesday with the producer price index. That's that PPI measure of inflation. It always follows the CPI, the consumer price index each month. Uh, expectations for producer prices to have fallen 0.1% from the month before. It's usually kind of an afterthought since most people are focused on the CPI, the consumer price inflations. But if we do see a further drop in inflation confirmed here with producer prices, that could help support the broader market, not necessarily uh, from the retail sales and the consumer discretionary stocks, but it could support the broader market if it shows that inflation is, in fact, keeps, keeps coming down. 
Uh, Friday, last economic report we see is the existing home sales report is expected to show a 12th consecutive monthly decline to just 4 million homes sold on a seasonally adjusted basis. Okay, this would be down from about 6.5 million pace uh, reported in January of last year. So the housing market is not necessarily crashing, but it is slowing down very quickly. We have not seen the full effect of interest rate hikes on the housing market. We're going to start seeing that go through. And, uh, and I think that is going to bleed into the rest of the economy. The weakness in the housing market is going to bleed into the rest of the economy in 2023 and is going to be one of the things that, that really ends up pushing us into a recession. Click on the video to the right for the first in our This Versus That series, a series of videos comparing the most popular stocks against each other. Last week, we compared some of your favorite stocks, Tesla, NVIDIA, Google, AMD, Amazon, all to find the best investment. So don't miss that. Don't forget to join the Let's Talk Money community by tapping that subscribe button and clicking the bell notification.